Hi everyone, welcome back to the Move and Inspire podcast. I'm really, really excited to have Emma Cannon um, as my interviewee today. I've been wanting to interview Emma for a really, really long time. She's super special to me. She's become a mentor to me. Um, and I came across Emma, I want to say a couple of years ago when I lost my period, which I will go into um, during our conversation. But firstly, hi, Emma. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> So I'm recording from Bali. Emma is in cold, cold England. Yeah, it's lovely to see you. And uh, yeah, it's great to with see you. you. And I'm so glad that we've been able to keep up the connection since you've been gone. The one. Yeah, it's been amazing, actually. But I would love you just to start to to explain a little bit about you and what you do, and also how. Um, kind of what we just touched on, how your work has changed so much due to the current climate and COVID, etc. Yeah. Okay, so I really started out in, I guess, wellness, spirituality, when really there wasn't, well, there was no name for wellness, for sure. So it was about 1993, I guess. And um, I took a trip to San Francisco. I'd worked in an oil company and I and I took a trip to San Francisco. And it was so different um, there to what was happening in England. And I was my mind was really open to meditation and um, and diet and and all of that kind of that whole world. None of which was sort of happening in in England at the time. Maybe it was even earlier. I think it was even earlier. I think it was 1991. It was the time of the Gulf War. So I arrived in San Francisco and everyone was sort of hanging out on street corners playing <laughs> Lennon songs, singing, it's just saying it's just like Vietnam all over again. And it was just a really incredible day to be there. It was a, it was a day that the, the Gulf War broke out, really. Um, and there was a, a bit like now, actually, there was a lot of change. Um, and, and I was young, I was in my 20s, and my whole mind was just blown open by this kind of radical change that was going on there, but also based in, um, I guess it was based on the movement from the 60s, you know, um, peace and love and all of that. So it was kind of like a resurgence of that. And I just really got fascinated with diet and um, uh, Chinese medicine. And I then came back to England and trained as an acupuncturist, which I sort of have been doing for the last 25 years and specialising in the area of fertility. Um, so that's kind of how I got into it. And I read a book called The Web That Has No Weaver, actually. And in this book, um, he talks about... The book of Western medicine um, is constantly being written. Um, the book of Chinese medicine is sort of static. It was written many, many years ago. And although a lot of the ideas are, you know, universal truths or natural truths, it's, it's a static thing. It's not really evolving. Whereas Western medicine evolves all the time. And by the very nature of science, what we say doesn't exist today you know, somebody will prove you wrong tomorrow. So it's a constantly evolving um, entity, which has completely fascinated me. And I am very scientific in a way, but I'm, what I'm really interested in is where science meets spirituality and where science meets food and the brain. And that, that's the kind of sci the science that I'm into. So, um, so I spent my career kind of building bridges with Western medicine, really. Um, and wrote some books and really was just working more in the mainly I was I'm known for fertility um, but then what happened in lockdown was I ha well uh, let's go to the October let's go to October 2019 I just knew that something was really changing rad going to change radically I just felt it I've been working with energy for 25 years so I get a sense and when you work with people all the time you know that things aren't happening to people individually you get a sense that things are happening collectively so I've I've for many years I've felt that that we're we're one and we're connected and because of Chinese medicine you know you're very much seen as part of nature or nature you are nature really it's not even that you're part of nature you are nature 
Um, so I, so these ideas are not, not familiar to me. That's really what I've, I've practiced all these years. So in October, 2019, I just really, I even had a conversation with the universe. I just sort of said, I know that, I know that you're telling me that I need to shift out of what I'm doing. Um, and I, I've got to find a way to do it. You know, please, please be gentle with me (laughs) because usually when things happen in my life, they're like really like big (laughs) like forcing me to change it's like you think you can stay where you are forget it we're going to push you further so I knew that that I had to change but didn't really know how to do it because I had a very successful practice and people were coming and so every week the diary was full and that's and every time I opened a diary thank you the universe you know it would fill and um and it's really hard to get out of that because I loved it as well so it's not like I wasn't loving it but I just knew there was more and I was increasingly feeling like women were turning to IVF really too quickly or they were impatient not infertile or they were rushing to me an hour after work and coming to me and just lying there for half an hour and just having acupuncture and I was thinking am I really am I really serving them or am I becoming part of the problem so I had this deep sense and then of course hey presto the universe delivered and it it really wasn't gentle at all Um, and I knew pretty quickly and I think I knew because I'd had that experience in October I knew straight away that I was going to shut my clinic in Chelsea Um, and um, I just thought this is going to run and run this is not something that's going to go the go away I've had this yearning to do something else. In a way, I knew that that's I had to do it. I mean, I literally cried for for three weeks every day. I just woke up and cried. It still makes me want to cry now. (laughs) Because it was, the clinic was amazing. It was beautiful. Everyone that came there loved it. You know what it was like. It was just like this real healing space. And interestingly, I went back once. I only went back once because of various health reasons, one of which was losing my eyesight. Um, But anyway, I went back once and I walked into there and I was like, it's done, it's gone. The energy was gone. It was so interesting. The people were gone. I wasn't in there. It was just a room. And I was like, it's just a room, you know. And you can find other ways to, to change energy. Do you want me to keep going? <laughs> Well, do you know what? I think what would be really cool is to um, for me to explain a little bit about my connection with you. Yeah. Um, just to kind of explain what happened with me. So I um, I lost my period, um, I want to say t- around October 2017. I was on the pill for a really long time, maybe like 12 years. Um, I didn't want to come off the pill because I was getting married in 2018 and I thought my skin was going to break out and... My gynecologist was like, you're fine, don't worry. When you come off the pill, you'll get your period back, don't worry. So got married 2018, went off the pill. My period didn't come back and I wanted to start trying for babies. And the more and more I started thinking about it, there was this like um, uh, calling for me to find someone who wasn't just in the um, kind of Western medicine IVF field because what I felt was that I was getting a solution possibly with IVF to being able to have a baby, but not a solution to why I don't have a period and actually looking at the underlying problem. Like here's your quick fix for a baby or not quick fix, but you know what I mean? Um, But no one was actually talking about me getting my period back. So I felt really uncomfortable actually about this whole kind of um, what was being presented to me. And then two things really drew me to you. One was I listened to a podcast, um, Madeline Shaw's podcast that you were on and uh, and started looking you up and was like, okay, I want to go and see Emma Cannon. And then really weirdly around exactly the same time, a doctor that we both know um, reached out to me and said, I think you should go and see Emma. And I think that day I had emailed your secretary to be like, I want to come and see you. And I really felt like I needed support um, mentally and emotionally around this whole thing and then I came and saw you and um, you told me uh, so much more than anyone had ever told me in terms of what could be the problem with me um, not having a period and it was all to do with my insomnia anxiety that I'd had over the years Um, 
and I felt incredibly settled in your presence and I was very scared of coming actually because it was something very new to me I hadn't really done acupuncture before and um so, so we did our session of acupuncture and the next morning I got my period and I remember just being like wow <laughs> What is this? This is crazy. Yeah. And then I effectively came and saw you every week for about a year. And the cool thing about our relationship is, like, for me, it was, like, not just about getting the acupuncture and physically my period kind of starting to come back. And it did take a while um, to get it more regular. Um, For me, it was like you became this mentor and this friend. And we'd have these incredible discussions about life. Um, and we connected on so many different levels. I remember when one thing you said to me that really, really hit home was I was saying to you how guilty I felt for the fact that my father was helping me pay for my acupuncture because I couldn't afford it and um, how guilty that made you, me feel. And I remember you left the room and you came back 10 minutes later and, and you <laughs> said, in, instead of guilt, why don't, you, why don't you find gratitude? Why don't you just think about... Um, being really grateful that your father can give you this and I remember thinking because I'd said to you I'm going to write this email to my dad saying I'm so sorry that I'm taking your money to do this acupuncture and you were like why why don't you write the email to say thank you so much (laughs) and it was just such such an obvious thing but it was just like this moment that really stuck with me but anyway what's been beautiful about again our relationship is that I decided to move to Bali but we really realized that we could carry on and it wouldn't be the acupuncture but it would be more about compassionate inquiry which I would love you to talk a little bit about well so that so that's um thank you for reminding me of all that loveliness because um you know I I you know the work is amazing and but you know obviously sometimes you do really connect really deeply with people and you go on a bit of a journey with them and I always say every day my my questions lead me um to to patients or clients because you know the questions that I philosophically ask myself will manifest themselves <laughs> in someone in my waiting room or or at the end of a zoom now um so so luckily fortuitously I had done a training with um Gabal Mate and I had um I read his book when the body says no um and and as I was when I was reading it, he doesn't really talk about fertility, he's not a fertility expert at all, he's more addiction and he looks at autoimmune. But when I was reading his book, I was like, This is exactly as I've been witnessing in my fertility patients. Exactly. And this is a kind of Western medicine doctor talking about a, a way to access this or a way to deal with it. Because I was increasingly getting frustrated because I was like the acupuncture is great, but it's it's really not the it's really not just the acupuncture. It's the me coming into the room and saying those things like little arrows at the point where the needles are in you, and I'm by and I'm changing the way your neural pathways are working because, or you know, we're doing that together. That's something that's going on between the two of us. So you give me the information, and I kind of reboot it. And and then I, I, I really came to realise that I didn't need acupuncture to change energy because that's what I'm doing with the acupuncture. That it was, you know, and I'm not putting acupuncture down at all, but I think we're moving into a different time as well. You know, it's, it's very much of the body. You know, it has a disadvantage in a pandemic that you have to actually get up close to someone, you know, and there are other ways to change energy. And I and I'd witnessed in myself over the years that sometimes it was the things that I was saying and it was the alchemy that was happening between me and the client that was making the change. So so I did the training with Gabal Mate, thank, thankfully, because it gave me an, another skill. Um, and what I've done with his, his method is I've really combined it with all the, the way that I already worked. Um, but I've combined his method with my method, basically. So I... I do something that I call fertile inquiry now, which is a mixture of him and me, really. But but what was so revolutionary about him was actually just finding this book and going, yes, that's what I've been witnessing for twenty five years, and I and are having a framework to put it in. And that is that you know sometimes our bodies are saying no, and sometimes our immune systems are saying no to things because we don't feel safe. And really the work that I do now and I've done for many years is cultivating that sense of safety. And that's most of the reason why things started working again in you, because you felt safe. 
you know, you felt safe with me, but you were able to cultivate that sense of safety within yourself because you weren't always acting out of your triggers all the time. And because, my dear, you have the most willing soul that really wants to evolve <laughs> and uh, you are such a pleasure to work with because you know you take you take it on and you integrate it and and I think that's what sometimes doesn't happen and that's what was happening with the acupuncture sometimes people would just come there and lie and they're almost handing their health over to someone else like we do in western medicine um and and I again I'm a big fan of science but I'm not I'm not necessarily a big fan of the way that the structures are set up to deliver it and the limitations that within that but you know western medicine has told us that we don't have to invest in our health at all we can live exactly as we want to live and it's okay because someone's going to be there to pick up the pieces when it all goes wrong well i think <laughs> i think we're now discovering that this is a, a you know a not a truth so basically patients would come there and they would lie and they would almost just be passive. And and it's not a passive thing. You know, when you engage in healing, it's a two-way thing between the practitioner and the patient. And there has to be a willingness. So it's very unlike Western medicine where you do just, you are passive. You basically hand your health over to someone. And, and this is one of the cracks that's kind of being revealed at the moment, I think, is that we were told that um, you could live exactly as you want to live. You don't have to take any responsibility for your health at all. You can smoke, you can drink, you can you can be overweight, you can be anorexic, you know what I mean? You can be, you can live exactly as you want to live and, and that you don't have to take any responsibility. If things go wrong, we'll just take care of you. And that isn't true. That isn't true. And we're seeing the cracks in that system now. Um, and... Uh, and so I, I think what what the best relationship, the best health relationship is where the, the, the client or the patient takes responsibility and you're there as a guide. Of course, at times we need Western medicine, at times we need IVF, at times we need cancer treatment, we need all of these things. I, I think it's just this um, incongruency with just handing your health over to somebody else and it's their responsibility and not taking any responsibility for it yourself. And of course, there's economic reasons for that as well. And um, it's the, the idea of a quick fix as well, right? Like take a pill and we'll just fix you. And I feel like I get that a lot with um, clients in terms of um, people feeling really frustrated that they're not there yet. Like, and I always say, like, it's baby steps. It's not one big thing and it's going to be a magical, fi magical yeah, fix. It's baby steps. And we're continually, we always, me and you always talk about how we're going to continually do the work for the rest of our lives. Because once you start going, it's just fascinating what you open yourself up to. Yeah. And, 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 and I was, I was actually saying this to someone yesterday, because she was sort of saying to me, you know, I just feel like, you know, complete and the, I've arrived and everything. And I said, like, Oh, great, you're Buddha. I said, good luck. So give me some tips. And, and I, and I said, No, no, the invitation is that, you know, once you become conscious, actually, there's so much more work to do, because, you your the invitation to you is that that is to to seed it to take that and to put it into the world um and and not through you know <laughs> being a, a sort of spiritual nazi but by being you know being a guide for people and you know help help holding their hand and realizing that we're all evolving all the time there's not really an arrival point um unless you are buddha i guess <laughs> it's uh, for me it's also just like I think people think it's it has to be this like spiritual woo woo stuff and it's actually not it's just about almost like getting better at life that's what I think of it it's just like how can I get better at life for me not for anyone else but just for me yeah I love that getting better at life yeah it's <laughs> it's, it's really true and um oh I mean I think I I'm very grateful for for um, what the tool the tools that I've learned and and how diverse life is and I sometimes think 
Oh, I just sometimes think, well, how are the muggles coping with this, <laughs> with this pandemic? You know? <laughs> because it's like, if you haven't even put us, I mean, I believe we're all evolving, actually. I think our, all of our consciousness is evolving, whether we know it or not at the moment. Um, and there are people that will have been doing this and there is no hierarchy. Um, and, and there are people that are just beginning, but it, it is a, it's a continual thing. It's not a, I've done it, it's arrived and I'm fixed kind of thing. Um, Can you um, explain a little bit more about actually what compassionate inquiry is and then um, maybe a little bit about your method and how me and you, or um, with your clients, how you do your Zoom <laughs> Zoom calls? I mean, I'll talk about my method because compassionate inquiry isn't my method, it's, it's, um, it's Gabor's. Um, but the basic premise is that um, you you think of a trigger so you think of something that so a trigger is something that disturbed you emotionally for instance so when they said that to me I felt like this um or yesterday I had I had a, a, a client coming to me and and everyone's getting very triggered at the moment, by the way. This is what's happening. Everyone's woundings are coming up to the surface, I'm finding, and we're all having to work through them. And it's something to do with being locked in or, you know, having a lot of our st the stimulation taken away from us. I think that we're, you know, we're seeing this more um more and more um so she was she was in hospital she just had an embryo transfer and the doctor in there just said well you, you know you only had one egg and you know so the chances are quite low and and like triggered this whole idea that her that she's not good enough um so with the fertile inquiry or the compassionate inquiry, what we do is I'd invite her to feel into the body. So where do you feel this in the body? And it's really being with the sensation. So not going into your head, really feeling where it's showing up in the body. So, she, so you might say it's in my stomach. Um, and what does it feel like? What's the sensation? The sensation is, is heavy, feels really heavy. And I said, is it okay to be with that feeling for a bit? So it's encouraging the person to be with the feeling because the feeling is the gateway to the healing. And all the time we go into the head all the time or we bypass the feelings because we don't want to feel them. So we cut off from the feelings. And really the feelings are our messengers. So they're just alerting us, you know, to danger or, or you know, discomfort or... Um, you know, I need to protect myself. I need to, you know, I need to rally. And, um, and then the immune system goes through this whole cascade, danger, 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 alert. In terms of fertility, you know, we wouldn't have been designed to conceive in a time when we felt a danger. So again, it's creating the sense of inner safety. You know, not trying to find safety all the time in our outer world because one of the one things we're being demonstrated at the moment is that the safety doesn't exist out there, right? It's where can I find a sense of safety within myself? And of course, that's the ideal place to conceive a child from because you need to, you would conceive when you felt safe. And so then you, you feel into that, the feeling in the body, and then you see if there's an emotion attached to it. So what is the emotion attached to it? So it might be anger or sadness. So sometimes people go into a belief, they say, oh, I feel that, um, you know, um, you know, I'm not enough or, you know, that's a belief. So it's an emotion, first of all. And then cut a long story short, you retrace it to its origins. So and it's amazing what people come up with. I've had bullying situations. I've had rows between parents. I've had um, I've had, had a few funny ones with you. <laughs> Um, um, and it's amazing and I just have to say to people because everyone's a lot of people are stuck on being right and they'll say I'm not sure it's the right one and I'm like no it is the right one whatever came up it's right and then you just work with that to kind of change the situation so I had somebody the other day whose mother had fallen had a row with her and she bought her this denim skirt which she'd accidentally ripped and the mother was so furious that she sort of ripped the denim skirt up in front of her into shreds I mean that's a really violent like like traumatic thing to do anyway and in, so but in the in the compassionate fertile inquiry process what we did is we repainted that picture so I said so what did you need in that moment that you didn't get 
So you bring compassion to it. And you also, um, so yeah, we brought compassion to it. So we got the mother to sew the, the, the men the skirt and sew on a little love heart patch. And like we made it like a, a, a much more compassionate um, situation. And in those situations of trauma, that's when we form beliefs about ourselves and those beliefs shape our future. So in those really pivotal moments when something traumatic happened and wasn't dealt with properly um, or compassionately, because her mother could have dealt with that compassionately and wouldn't have been an issue. Um, but in those moments, we set up a belief about ourselves. So the belief there might have been that I'm a really bad person. You know, and then she spends the rest of her life com compensating for the fact that deep down she feels like she's a bad person. Um, and you can do all the counselling that you want, but unless you turn, ch change the neural pathway and the feeling in the body so that next time you go into it, you recognise it, it never really changes. And that's what I was finding with the acupuncture is that it didn't quite get right to the core of it. It helped. Um, and, um, and people changed and people got better and people, you know, but without the, some of those really traumatic situations, I really wanted another tool. Um, and it feels like nothing is happening, but actually everything is happening and, um, it can change it, it just like forming those belief systems at that stage of your life can change the course of your life because of how you react to things all throughout your life and what you attract, changing them and bringing compassion to them and healing to them can also change the course of your life going forward. It's such beautiful work. Honestly, the, the, honestly, Gabor, I just think, brought this gift to the world at this time when we really need compassion. You know, if, if there's something we need right now, it's for people to become more compassionate. So you can be in a situation like um, and you can be triggered, but because you've worked on that trigger, um, you don't respond in the same way. Yeah. So I think in, in we're, we're in a time where really we need compassion and we need more compassion. And um, this process is really beautiful because it means that we're not always acting out of our triggers um, and um Gabor has this lovely thing that he says which is we are not to blame but we are responsible um and and even that just brings so much healing so when you're in that situation and you know your your mother or your father or somebody did something to you that you perceived in a certain way they are also not to blame so it's not about making people wrong it's about bringing compassion to the situation and i have witnessed the most beautiful healing going on that's almost generational you know because if you can forgive that that person in that situation as well you sort of, you set them free as well um so it is really really beautiful stunning work and and the fact that you can do it via zoom as well I think is you know it's keeping everybody safe and and it's cultivating that sense of safety and I've seen in myself how much I've changed as well and I've done years of work I've done so many different things um but I I've I've found this to be one of the most effective things as well and maybe because I'm very developed as well that I've been able to take it and really make it into something and use it in a really constructive way because I've combined it with all my other skills as well I think that's also part of it um, but it's, but it's a very beautiful work for sure. There's two things that I think, um, really hit me then one being, um, the beauty and forgiveness and how you actually set yourself free by forgiving. And then the other thing being whether it's, whether you're looking at someone else or yourself. So, um, if I give an example of, of me, if I look back at, um, some things I've done and I feel guilt. I remind myself in the most compassionate way that I can that I didn't know any better. But I do know better now. So therefore I'm going to take that and I'm going to learn from that. But there's no point in having that guilt because I didn't know better. Or if you've got a, um, a trauma with a family member or whatever it is, thinking that family member doesn't know better. 
but I do know better. So how can I take responsibility in this situation? Yeah. Yeah. And responsibility is a really interesting thing as well. And, and, and this is something that's one there's been a lot of themes that have been coming up recently. Guilt is one of them. Um, and, um, uh, but also responsibility because there's personal responsibility, but there's a lot of people that, that feel that they're responsible for everyone else as well. And, and that's, that's part of guilt, isn't it? I, I feel responsible for this other person's sadness or, um, and, and it's about, and I know you've done a lot of work on boundaries, so well done, cause you do it for all of us when you do it. <laughs> um, but, um, but also this idea of responsibility, what is my responsibility and what is not my responsibility? And one of the sort of the leadership or laws, rules of healing that I've learned is that actually when you are take over responsibility for somebody else, you're actually denying them the opportunity um, to grow themselves because you're you know you're sort of stepping in and trying to to dictate how it should be or take care of them or or you're feeding into their pattern so it's about knowing what your responsibility is and what is their responsibility I think that's really important I love that I feel like I've done I'm or I'm still doing a lot of work around um codependency and that's basically the codependency where you we, we want to save people and we want to fix people as codependents. And Mark Groves says this, uh, he, said, he basically says, don't deprive people of their rock bottom. Because when people hit their rock bottom, that is when they decide to step up and grow. And people have to step up from, for themselves. You can't step up for them. You can support, but in that non in a loving way, in a non-codependent way. So yeah, I think it's possible to love and to support without without rescuing and without being responsible for for the other person, um, and th- and that's really you know that's really big work. And also w- with the situation that you describe when when you felt guilty um, towards your dad paying, and I uh, we you know I said well, how about replacing it with gratitude? Again, you you sort of were denying your dad the opportunity to feel good about what he did um, by by laying your guilt onto him kind of thing um so when you think of it like that it really turns it around on its head because it actually achieves the opposite to what you're hoping to achieve um so yeah uh, the, it's very nuanced all of this stuff yeah it reminds me of something as well that I did a lot of work on in therapy um, in terms of like language and accepting comp- compliments. So one of the things my therapist said was every time you say, if someone gives you a compliment and you're like, oh, no, 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 I just got lucky or like my mom would probably be like, oh, I'm privileged or, you know, I've had a really um, lucky upbringing or whatever it would be. You are denying that person of being able to give you that compliment they wanted to give you something and you're basically throwing it back in their face by saying oh no no you know I'm unworthy of your compliment so now I'm really careful to say when people say to me oh you've been you know amazing moving to Bali you've been so brave or whatever I'm like thank you so much and also it helps it helps me remember that yeah I have been brave but the more I say the more if I if I was to say oh I've just been lucky then I'm creating those neural pathways, which tells me I'm undeserving. So it's, yeah, it's so interesting. We've talked, I think we talked about this with my daughter, Violet, because um, if you say to my daughter, Violet, I must have done a good job on her on receiving, because you say to Violet, you look lovely in that. She sort of grows and you can see her just going, thank you so much. And you can see her just absorbing the compliment into her. <laughs> and it's so, it's so beautiful to watch. And I was just like, I was nothing like that when I was her age. And it's, it's not arrogance. It's, there's a, I think that one of the things that modern women struggle with and, and possibly men too but I've always worked with women is um is the inability to receive you know sometimes there's help on offer um the support on offer um, b- but we're so stuck in our independence or we don't know how to receive help or we don't know how to receive receive a compliment even um and that has been a huge part of my healing journey as well is the ability to receive um support and help from other people and it is not just my responsibility 
to to help other people it's it's a two-way energetic thing and and when you get into that which i really think is new paradigm energy you know there isn't and just as there isn't an uh, a set amount of compassion in the world the, the compassion doesn't have you know it doesn't run out <laughs> um but it does we're unable to access compassion if we're not compassionate with ourselves and it's the same with this new energy it is you've got to be you've got to be coming from that authentic place within yourself otherwise it doesn't work but as soon as you tap into that it is a um, it regenerates the energy regenerates and it doesn't run out so there's enough for everyone yeah it's such a nice uh, way of looking at it we've touched on um responsibility but something um uh, a while ago you gave me this phrase and i go back to it time and time again and I really encourage everyone to remember this phrase because for me um, I, I'm really forgetful but if I have like a framework then I remember to, to do it so it's curiosity compassion and responsibility can you kind of talk us through that yeah so curiosity is um, the so when you say you ha- say you're triggered by something or say you react in a certain way it's like instead of making yourself wrong or beating yourself up or making the other person wrong or, you know, I, I used to get this a lot with fertility patients. You know, they would say that this person didn't say the right thing or they, you know, yeah, that's true. But often people don't say the right thing, but it, it you know, it triggered a response in that person. So instead of getting angry or reacting, it's like you get curious. And that's that's the first step with the compassionate inquiry process that we described is like you get curious. It's like, God, that's really interesting. I really reacted to that. That really got my back. <laughs> I wonder why that is, you know? And so just, and then the feeling into the body again, I'm not going to repeat the process, but so it's that curiosity and fascination. And, and you know, I, ha- I had to have um, 15 sessions of radiotherapy to my pituitary so I had to get this this in just after lockdown so I had to have a, a a mask fitted to my face like a plastic mask and I had to be pinned to the bed and I had to go into a radiotherapy machine and I had to go every day for 15 days to the hospital and have this done and the what I did is I I just thought I'm just going to get really curious about it and or fascinated you know so it's like actually it's amazing that they can do that you know because I'm so full of fear and I'm like I have major hospital phobia <laughs> and in and and a, a lack of sense of safety and trust in you know that system um and I, I'm very grateful for the treatment that I've had but I there is definitely it's a trigger for me and you know, that comes from deep in childhood. Um, and um, anyway, so I decided that I was going to be curious and fascinated by it and compassionate. And so I turned the whole thing into this. Um, I'm not going in for radiotherapy. It's a high priestess mission and they're downloading new codes for humanity onto my brain. <laughs> So when I went in there, I was really compassionate. So the second one, curiosity of what they were doing, but also compassion for them So and for myself. And because I was giving myself loads of compassion, it was easy for me to be compassionate to them in that situation. And and so I would go in and instead of being in fear, I I was on this high priestess mission. And after every time they zapped my pituitary, I would give them the download that I got so I'd say to them and this is a compassion bit you know you're more amazing than you would ever imagine you know you are infinite um and um and then the responsibility bit so the responsibility is it's it, it's knowing again what we said what what is my responsibility and what isn't my responsibility and sometimes our sense of over responsibility towards other people is a compensatory reaction to something in our childhood or or something a belief that we have about ourselves that unless we behave in a certain way we're not going to be likable you know unless we're you know unless we show up on time and do you know x y and z then we're not you know so what we do is is it with responsibility is we make our we compensate for this lack that we feel about ourselves 
by making everything our responsibility. Um, and um, and it's no, but you are responsible for yourself, um, but you aren't responsible for everyone else. And my lovely friend Janet puts it <laughs> a really a really good way. And I said, well, you know, you're, you're, we'd say, well, what happens if that person reacts in that way? And well, what happens if that person says that? And she's like, what they think and how they react is none of your business. And it, it's kind of true, you know. It's... Yeah, I. It was that was literally going to lead me to that because that was something I learned on my codependency, or it was being talked about on my codependency course that I was doing this morning. Like trying not to take on other people's reactions of you. If you can stand in like the power of your truth that you've been authentic, you've done what you think is right. How someone else is else reacts if it's a bad let's say it's a bad reaction it's not your responsibility and you don't need to take that on you get to choose whether you take that on or not and you can have these like that the codependency and um boundaries are so intertwined it's like trying not to be so enmeshed in in other people that their reactions to you cause you pain it's like actually having that boundary where their shit can bounce off and you don't have to accept it you don't have to like put it in your pocket you know but what life will do is life will keep giving you those situations that are tapping into your wound so unless you are doing the work you will react um and so it's not really as you know it, 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 yeah we can put up boundaries and things like that but but sometimes we have to go into the wound which is that other work as well because uh, um, I'm not saying it's one or the other. It's it's just it's just a kind of development of that. It's just it's hard to not react if it keeps on pressing in a wound. You know, it's like this wound is open and it is it just gets keeps getting opened and opened and opened. So it's the awareness that actually our reaction is coming from something in us. Yes. So so um, so we have wounds and and if they're open and if we haven't dealt with them, then life will keep giving showing us <laughs> and then will keep triggering us until we work on that wound really or we just keep having the same reactions to things over and over and over and over again which is really dull <laughs> um and and i think that's the invitation at the moment and and I, and that's what i think is this shift in our consciousness is i think that people are are taking more well hopefully I know we're in an echo chamber but you know there is more of a sense of personal responsibility and actually is there something that I can do um about this to stop myself from reacting in a in a certain way and it's difficult because we want to blame and we want to make it someone else you know and and for 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 many reasons we want to do that for the reasons the way that that society is being constructed the way that you know, we were brought up, not that it, not making it wrong, but it was just with what we had, the information that they had at that time, the information that I had at the time when I parented my, my children, you know, we all have wounds and, um, and they will, life will keep showing you those wounds. They will keep giving you opportunities to heal them. Um, and I'm seeing that thick and fast at the moment with people. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And myself. I am um, every day. And myself, you know. The one of the the um things that I think fits so well with the curiosity is is something that I believe yoga has really taught me, which is that um because you can't get curious unless you take a beat, right? So you have to have that moment where you take a, a pause, a breath where you're you're like, Oh, I'm being triggered. Because otherwise you just go straight into anger or storming out or whatever it is but that doing the work so you have that ability just to take a moment to breathe so you can become aware of what's going on for you yeah yeah for sure for sure and it, it's a pra it, you know it's a deeply spiritual practice <laughs> it, and it's a choice like you say you know it is a choice to to, to do the work you know so and and again more um more needed than ever because as we can see we aren't in control of anything so we can't control what's going on around us but we can control how we react to those things yeah and I think more and more and this is really my the work that I'm doing now and like I said it earlier on it's like creating that that safety within ourselves um and um and I and 
It's really interesting because I was really tested on that the other day. Of course, you know, all the things that we teach in the world, we're going to be tested and tested on them ourselves over and over again. And um, I had to go into the hospital and I, uh, and I've spoken to you about this, but it's, I think it's an interesting situation is, and I witnessed how unsafe the systems are at the moment. So, you know, they're down on staff there's no way they can protect people, you know, in the in the hospital um, from contracting. Even if they test people all the time, there's no way they can guarantee your safety. And um, and I and I and I felt in a I was in a really unsafe environment. Um, but I didn't feel unsafe. I I I checked in with myself and I was like, Do you feel safe right now? I didn't with what was going on around me and I could see fear around me. I could see fear in the people around me, but for myself, I was like, how do you feel? And I felt safe. I didn't feel angry. I didn't feel agitated. Um, and, but it was all coming from the inside because nothing in the outer structures were giving me any safety or guaranteeing me any safety. Um, and I think this is the work that that that's the invitation at the moment is how do we create that for ourselves within ourselves how do we create um compassion more compassion within ourselves um and someone on my instagram said the other day um well you know i i i'm you know i do have hope i'm 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 doing the work but i'm worried that everyone else in the world isn't evolving and doing the work and again i was like but that that's not that's not your responsibility. Um, and also you just work on yourself because all the time we're going, well, I'm OK. It's everybody else. Well, actually, are, are, we, are you OK? You know, what is you know, what happens around your dinner table? Is there love there? Is you know, what are your interpersonal relationships like? Focus on that. There's plenty to be done there <laughs> without lashing out at, at what everyone else is doing. And, um, yeah, there may be some truth in that, but we, we, we can't do anything about that. We're powerless to that. Um, so all we can do is, is our own stuff. And there's, I'm sure you've seen this a lot in, um, uh, everything you do, but like, I definitely think there's, um, when you do the work, interestingly, the people that you would ne not necessarily ever think would do the work, they follow if they see how, it's had such an impact on your life. So my mum has seen such a big shift in me, like huge shift over the last five years. And she, um, she's going to start a meditation course when all of this is done because she can see how much that has helped me. That, and that is the idea, is that when we evolve, you know, it, every, everything evolves around us. Um, and, and I, and I've witnessed that over the years for sure, for sure. And there is a speeding up of that now. There is definitely a speeding up of that now. And interestingly, we've moved into this sort of time of Aquarius where it's much more about the connection with the mind. It's much more, it's air, you know, it's about transmitting our thoughts, communicating through our thoughts. Um, uh, and we're, we're moving from a much more earth base type you know where there was a lot of touch there was a lot of possession you know I think um you, you're very in the spirit of um Aquarius you know having sort of limb you know reduced your possessions you're traveling very lightly this is all very kind of air um qualities and how more and more we're going to communicate in this way of course the other is always going to exist but there is going to be an emphasis more we found different ways to communicate with each other um and there's good and bad in that of course you know the internet is a great thing but it's also you know a negative thing in the way that it spreads false information and things like that so um we are we are it's happening to us but it's also happening collectively as well for sure I do just think, just looking at you right now, I'm like, you're just such an incredible inspiration because everything you're going through and you look super healthy, like I said, as soon as we got onto Zoom and you, um, you're, you're obviously going through your cancer treatment and this has been an um, ongoing battle um, and then and you talk about all this work that you're doing and how you react to the difficult situations in unprecedented times 
and you've still got this in this smile on your face and you were still wanting to do the podcast and so yeah I think it's just like it just shows how, how much this work works <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you. And and um, you know, interesting. I never think of it as a battle, and it's such a is a word that's really used with for, with with cancer, and it's never been my experience. It, for me, it's been an absolute spiritual expansion, um, because it is it's it's really taken me to the brink of my humanity, um, and and danced on that you know that that just that bit between heaven and earth. Um, and I just feel very expanded by it. I feel like my consciousness has been expanded like 20 lifetimes because of it, because of the challenges that I've had um, and, and and still have with it, you know. Um, and, um, and one of the things that, that, I, that I just wanted to talk about was that I talked talk to you about the, um, the high priestess mission, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm using chemotherapy at the moment. And I, I collaborated with chemotherapy. So I, can, I can't, became, and it sounds really strange, but I, I sort of had a conversation. So I kind of met with the soul of chemotherapy. <laughs> and I said okay chemo and I, I the chemotherapy I'm taking is taxol and taxol is um it's made from the fungi that grows in yew, yew trees and yew trees are the tree of life so I was like I quite like this I quite like this medicine this is like practically organic <laughs> <laughs> apart from the fact that it strips every hair from your your body and but I was like like I can I can find a way to work with this medicine so I I in my in my meditation I connected with the spirit of the taxol and I really came up with a a, a collaboration in the spirit of, of Aquarius <laughs> and which is all about collaboration and I said listen Taxol, you're really hot. You're really good at what you do. <laughs> I have enormous respect for you, but I also am an immense source of knowledge and information. So why and, and deep wisdom uh, that I have collected over all of these years of working with people. So why don't we collaborate with each other on this and show the world that that actually you work better with me and I work better with you? Why don't we try and show the world that? So I have this deal with the with the taxol where and and I also have these images um in the future because I don't really think that time is linear either so I have these these images or I create these images one of them is I'm standing on stage in front of um, a group of medics and the um, on the board behind me it says you are the medicine um, because I really believe that and that's the one thing that's been coming through for me time and time again is you you are the medicine and um and and I'm telling them about how I work. I collaborated with Taxol um, to clear cancer from my body. Um, and another one is where I'm I'm with my consultant, and she's just saying we've never. I'm looking. We've never seen anything like this. <laughs> Um, I so, love that. yeah and, and when I first had the chemotherapy I honestly it, it was like a spiritual experience that is the only thing the only way I can describe it is I um I went in there with so much compassion for the staff as well but for myself and um very you know very in a place of gratitude and just received the medicine into my my body like it was um love and I had this experience where as it entered my body I almost became an atom with it it was like I became so expanded with this medicine that it kind of blew me open um like I was like a million cells I was just part of the cosmos part of this sort of oneness this grid of oneness and I have I have no trauma attached to having it at all. And my tumour markers have gone down increasingly. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, I think that what we can do with the mind... So I'm just being really playful with it, you know. Instead of going into fear every time a trigger comes up for me, which it does all the time, I'm curious about it, I'm compassionate about it, I'm compassionate to the people around me, I'm compassionate to myself... Um, and then I ultimately take the responsibility as well. So, 
Um, so amazing. <laughs> it's just like... You have an, an awesome imagination as well. I love it. <laughs> we all do, but I think we've been told that it's not like a good, you know, that it's like not a good thing. Imagination is an amazing thing, you know. It's amazing. And the more we can expand our minds, you know, the more we're going to evolve as human beings, you know. Yeah, I mean, look, we all die in this body. We will all leave this body. Um, um, but I do think our consciousness goes on and I will become part of a, you know, a bigger consciousness. And maybe, you know, you become part of a consciousness that's still impacting what's going on on Earth. Or maybe it's a totally different, separate experience. I don't know. Who knows about that? Um, but I don't, I don't fear that. Um, but I, but I do want to expand my mind and my experience here on earth and get better at life. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, you know, while I'm here, I don't want to waste it. I don't want to waste it for, you know, feeling full of fear and full of sorry for myself and handing the responsibility over to someone else. I'd rather collaborate, you know? So me and the tax hall, I love that. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love your collaborations. <laughs> it's really funny, the, the tax hall one. It's just like, yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about 2021, what you think is coming for you, what projects you have, um, yeah, anything else you want to share? Um, what is coming? I mean, look, I don't think that, I don't believe in this getting back to normal, right? I mean, if if we get back to normal, this whole thing opportunity has been wasted. I think that this I'm not saying that COVID is a good thing, but I think what it's doing is it's revealing the inequalities that exist that existed long before COVID, you know, Um, and um, and I think that it's part of a bigger shift in what's happening with us. So I think 2021 I think 2020 was a, the big reveal. You know, a lot has been revealed to us. And I think 2021, we're going to be um, shedding lots of things that aren't necessary. They might be belongings, they might be relations, they might be people, they might be jobs, they might be emotions, they might be trick traumas, you know, but I still think there's a huge shedding that's going on. Um, you know, you can see on some people are dealing with that on clearing out all their cupboards and <laughs> on Instagram. And, you know, it's funny how people react. But I think there's, an, uh, there's a shedding, you know, so that we can travel more lightly, so we can re- be more responsive. Because I don't think that we're going to go back to a time anytime soon where there's any certainty about anything. I think we're always, for, for, for a while now, it's going to be, oh, I made this plan and then it was unmade. You know, I mean, I used to remember my diary. It was all diaried out. I had my people in the diary for that day. I knew when I was going to my caravan in France and I knew, you know, my whole year would be planned out. It had a lovely rhythm to it, but it was all planned out. We're not in that energy anymore. We're in a completely different energy where we have to respond to what is. So it's much more about living in the moment. So I'm going to carry on living in the moment. I'm going to resist the temptation to keep saying, when this is all over, and be okay with what's okay now, yeah? Um, because I, I, and I, and I, um, I'm, I'm still not, I'm still doing it, you know, I'm still thinking, oh, I'd love to come see you when this is all over. No, it's about being okay with what's going on now, yeah? Um, and I guess as living with cancer, um, expanding with cancer rather than <laughs> battling cancer. So with my expansion that I'm going through with cancer is that um, I, I'm, I, I had to do that anyway. It's just now that everyone else is kind of do, having to learn that as well. Um, so I think that's a big theme for 2021 is, is continuing to be okay with what is, responding to what is, um, being flexible with your plans and being a bit lighter so you can move more easily. So that's definitely the things that I'm going to be working with. And I think that's a kind of collective feeling as well. I've got a really exciting project, which is my medicine woman. Well, it was a, men- a membership and now it's a mentorship <laughs> because it was more than a membership because I was doing some mentoring within it. 
And I'm creating a pack of consciousness cards with an artist um, who's in lockdown in Canada. So that's a really interesting process as well. And um, we're working through the five elements, the Chinese medicine elements. So the water, wood, fire, earth, metal. And um, for each element, there are going to be 10 medicines and they're going to be the light attributes and the shadow attributes. And on my mentorship, I teach um, I teach the group each medicine um, and I invite them to feel into each medicine and journey with each medicine. So it might be fear or it might be revenge. I mean, and you'd be amazed. I was like, revenge. I don't have any of that energy within me. Once you start sitting with it, it's amazing what comes up. <laughs> um, so so the, the mentorship is working with women through each of these elements. And um, and at the end of it, they will be a, they will it will be a pack of cards. So it will be this pack of cards. You are the medicine um, and um, and the and the the training in the cards is called my medicine women mentorship. So I'm really excited about that. And that starts in February. Yeah, February. I've got to get my skates on on it, but it will happen. It will just <laughs> unfold. Um, and. And then I'm going to just carry on doing my Skype um, consultations with people, my, you know, Zoom Skype consultations, Fertile Inquiry, because that's really lovely. And I'm just really uh, doing the work that makes my heart sing. I'm really aligning to my heart. I think we all need to do that more and more. In fact, my dad, who was a thought pioneer, really, he died when I was 16 in 1984, he died. And he used to tuck me up in bed every night and say, we all have a special gift and it's our duty to bring it to the world. And um, he, I mean, you know, that was way, 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 way back then when people didn't really think like that. And um, and so I just want to keep bringing my gifts to the world and really helping other people do that as well because I think that's how we're going to change and evolve um, as a species and you know and really our, for our consciousness to grow to its full potential that's that's what's making my heart sing I love it you are the medicine you are the medicine <laughs> yeah exactly oh thank you so so much Emma for giving um up your precious time it's been amazing like I feel like lots of stuff we've talked about we've talked about before but I've learned so much from this and I'm excited for us to continue our phone calls as well yeah for sure and I hope that recording and the technology worked well I trust <laughs> <laughs> yeah fingers crossed <laughs> thank you so much for listening for more inspirational tips, please head to www.sophiedeer.com and sign up for my weekly wellness letter.